Davis and Chairman of the House Republican High Tech Working Group, and uh, pleased to be participating in uh, this uh, Internet Caucus event with uh, some great friends of ours from the European Parliament. And uh, this is going to be a very informal discussion where uh, we'll go wherever Erica and Malcolm want to go, and then we want to open it up for uh, questions and comments from everybody in the audience, and let's uh, not try to guess what you're interested in talking about. You tell us. And uh, I have a few things on my list. Uh, we are very much uh, engaged uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and dealing with uh, patent issues that are of great concern uh, as they affect technology. Similarly, copyright protection, uh, the broadcast flag, radio flag issue, net neutrality, internet governance. Those are the five on mine. Malcolm said he wanted to, to touch on the issue that I know a little bit about of internet gambling. So we may, we may get into that as well. And I would, uh, it's a timely issue to talk about as well. And it's certainly very much related to the internet. Um, who should I turn to first for comments? All right, well, we'll go to Erica. And if you would introduce your other members who are with us, I know most of them, but I'm going to let you, I'm not going to take the chance. I'll miss somebody. Well, it's always nice seeing you, and it's always great uh, to know that the Internet and the Agriculture Committee is somehow fusioned, at least uh, when it comes to your capability, which I think is great. Uh, and thanks so much for having the opportunity again. And uh, I'd just love to introduce first my, uh, my colleagues, and I would love to start um, uh, from, the, from my side, from the left. I'm not sure if he loves this position, a uh, political position to take. James Allens, um, one of the co-founders of the European Internet Foundation, and... Uh, Lambert von Nistelrooy, who is very keen on working on the follow-up of VISIS, Edith Herzog, a member from Hungary, and um, with deep and strong interest uh, when it comes to privacy, but many other issues as well. Arlene McCarthy, well-known, covering all of our issues uh, from uh, privacy, and she's now the chairwoman, by the way, of our internal market committee, and it's good to have her with us. Um, have I forgot? Oh, Bill Newton Dunn, sorry so much. The second row, I'm not expecting you to sit in the second. And Pia Noe Kaupi. Um, uh, Bill is uh, covering since many years um, the more uh, critical stuff, so when it comes to, to criminal sanctions and, and investigations. So he's our expert on this. And Pia, patent issue, patent, 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 uh, you can name it, and um, since many years as well. Uh, we are here. Uh, Malcolm Herber, I'm, yes, will introduce as well my co chairman. Um, he's our programming committee uh, um, manager, as we call it, from the European Internet Foundation, um, and actually managing all of our programs very, very well, and with a strong and tight interest on telecommunication review and many other issues as well. Uh, my name is uh, Erika Mann, um, chairman uh, of the European Internet Foundation, and happy to be with you again. Uh, we have a strong interest in many of the issues. Do you want me to introduce some of the items very sure. briefly, uh, very briefly? I mean, it's a fascinating, and oh, I have to make a comment before I go ahead. Um, uh, so this is, um, all of our event is on the, uh, on the record, and we are uh, webcasted, so the, all the comments you would love to make, so the naughty ones, you better skip. Um, not the time to do, make them today. Um, and uh, yes, the items. Um, I mean, it's a fascinating time, I think, for both of us, because the, the um, items we, um, uh, which are related to all of the telecom and internet and, and media issues, um, um, I think are much more even on, on the public and, and the public focus and um, uh, so much more, uh, more interest uh, we can see, which is a good news and bad news at the same time. Good news, of course, uh, when public takes interest in the work of uh, politicians when it comes to, to the internet and to telecom. Um, I think it's good, it's fascinating because we, we clearly see that um, it's of public concern what we do. The bad news is, of course, it becomes more conflictual and sometimes much harder uh, to manage. Now, what's on the agenda for the European Union? I mean, uh, for us, it's a telecom review, which um, uh, we will uh, debate very, uh, very soon in, in the Parliament. Um, and it's something we do on, um, I mean, regularly. But, of course, it becomes, again, it becomes, like I, I said before, it becomes more conflictual because so many more interests are involved and it will be definitely not easy this time. There's a question about roaming charges, uh, which is a hot debate in the European Union and it's about the pricing models. 
um, and, and uh, we will have a, a debate on this as well. Then, of course, it's the uh, question about uh, how should one deal with newly emerging markets. It's not something new with us. Um, but, of course, we want to see uh, definitely um, and not a tight uh, regulation. Um, we want to give room for innovation and we want to give room uh, for developing this market. But again, um, some of the um, uh, operators um, uh, which are around much longer, of course, for them it's an, an issue uh, again and again. Um, we are debating in the Parliament the TV um, without uh, uh, frontiers um, uh, regulation. Um, and it's, um, it's an idea embedded um, to take part of the regulation uh, of the media, from the media sector into the internet uh, sphere. It's a very critical, very important regulation, and uh, we do hope um, that we can find the right balance again, because of course we want to keep the internet and um, the, the separate space it occupies in the moment, but of course there are items really, um, involved uh, which touch on, um, on the uh, media environment, where the media, um, the TV, TV uh, people and, and of course many others as well want to make sure that part of their regulation is taken into the internet environment. And it's a critical issue in how to protect, what kind of advisement, uh, advertisements one wants to see, what kind of rules should govern um, this fair. It's, it's not, not an easy one. We will go to uh, California. We are leaving tomorrow uh, for undertaking um, a discussion on the patent review. We have a strong interest to understand um, how this review is taking place in the United States. We have our own review procedure. So what we would love to see, not similar developments, or, because this is not going to take place and it's probably not necessary, but we would love at least to understand and we would love to see if there are some of the issues we can, uh, we can have uh, similar uh, standpoints on and we can take it from there. And then, of course, the big way, and then I would love to uh, uh, stop with this, the big issue um, which occupies, I think, us all is, you know, what kind um, of Internet we, we can see in the future. How open can it be? How open do we want it to be? Uh, what um, a kind of re, um, regulatory environment um, we, we love to see? Uh, how much control? Um, this is all the, the, the whole issue from Internet governance, but to, to the question... Um, you know, how much should uh, government should uh, get involved? Um, are we seeing the involvement of, um, you know, of, of areas where, um, like, um, like in China or in other parts of the world, which have a, a more, you know, government heavy-handed approach, um, and, uh, and areas where we uh, don't have the, we have the, the government not involved at all. So it's this, this kind of debate I think we need to look at, um, which becomes a more, uh, much more complex one than it already was in the past. And then there are many tiny bits and pieces, which I don't want to go into because it will just simply um, take too long, but I'm happy uh, any time to do this, and I'm sure um, Malcolm um, and all of the colleagues which are in this room are happy to do this as well. Thank you. I neglected to uh, introduce you. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Erica Mann, uh, as long as I have, uh, she is a member of the uh, European Parliament representing Germany and a member of the Socialist Group, or SOC, since 1994, chairman of the delegation to the EU-Mexico Joint Parliamentary Committee and is also a member of the Committee on International Trade, and she's chairman of the Transatlantic Policy Network's EU Steering Committee. And we're also very fortunate to be joined by Malcolm Harbour, who is also a member of the European Parliament, representing the United Kingdom, and is a member of the Bureau of the Group of European People's Party and European Democrats. Malcolm is a member of the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection and the Delegation for Relations with Japan. Malcolm, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, it, once again, it's a pleasure to be in your agricultural committee room. And I, I think um, there's a nice symbolism in the way you managed to combine those things so, uh, and, and see so many people here. By the way, there are still some seats in the middle, for those of you uh, I can see here. But I'm sure we can undertake to take questions from behind if you feel you're getting tired and you want to move around. There. Tim Lorden will pass a note that you want to, to intervene. Um, I think that... Um, Every time I come here, I am uh, struck by the fact that, uh, as legislators, we are dealing with so many common challenges. And to some extent, I think also that uh, we are seeing, um, as we are with, the te with technological issues, I think we are seeing a certain amount of convergence uh, in, in, in the way that we are approaching some of them. 
I was rather intrigued to just to demonstrate this, that the Wall Street Journal Europe uh, published uh, an editorial the other week uh, entitled Europe's Mar Bell Moment. So you can see that um, you know, even, even, even some of the great historic uh, decisions to deregulate telecoms in America are also still have um, echoes in the European context as well. And in a way, as Erica says, we are, we are actually uh, uh, in the middle of a, a really interesting phase at the moment because many of my colleagues here uh, worked intensively on the uh, reform, fundamental reform of the European telecoms or uh, electronic communications legislation, which, were, which came into effect in the beginning of 2003, uh, and which the Commission, under the provisions of those legislation, was required to review um, three years later, and that review is now underway. Uh, so that's an interesting position for the first time uh, for, for me, certainly, um, having been in politics a comparatively short time, only seven years compared to some colleagues, um, uh, to actually now look at the consequences of what you decided earlier and whether it's, it's working satisfactorily. Now, that uh, regulation, I think, was a pretty far-sighted piece of regulation in that it brought in a single framework for all um, electronic uh, communication. Uh, by whatever medium was used. That the essential basis of it was that it was technologically neutral. And it also significantly simplified the, uh, the previous legislative regime. It went down from, I think, 26 pieces of legislation to five. And also made it much easier for providers to get authorization and move into the market. And the whole basis of it was uh, to stimulate competition. Um, to be seen as a transitory framework uh, where eventually the, the sector will be governed by the basic rules of competition policy, uh, but to deal with some of the specific issues uh, by uh, setting up a, a regulatory regime, which responsibility will be delegated to 25 countries, as we are now, shortly to be 27, uh, but uh, where the regulators will be given powers to intervene in the market, particularly to deal with bottlenecks, um, to mandate access, um, and interconnection requirements. And linked into that also was the, uh, I think, a, a very important piece, enabling piece of regulation of the so-called unbundling of the local loop. Now, part of the analysis, I think, and I think this is actually interesting for anybody involved, and um, anybody here who hasn't seen the European papers, they're all available on the Commission website. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of quite detailed analysis. But I think now there is sufficient body of evidence uh, to show quite clearly that where that regulation has been fully and effectively implemented by a properly resourced independent regulator, you are seeing more competition and more activity. And some of the key indicators like broadband penetration, for example, um, are significantly higher. If you look in Europe at the moment, you see that um, the Netherlands, um, uh, Denmark, uh, Finland, uh, and Sweden are significantly the top of the list in terms of broadband penetration. And if you look at the level of competition and activity in those markets, there's a striking correlation. I think that's very important uh, for us as regulators, but that's, that doesn't mean to say there isn't more work to be done. But the conclusions that the European Commission, as the executive body, has made quite clearly in, in the review papers are that the basic structure of the regulation does not need to be changed, and we don't need to change any of the fundamentals. Uh, in fact, they're proposing to uh, simplify some of the provisions and reduce the number of markets that were where um, intervention currently um, is required, markets that have to be analyzed and where um, intervention provisions can be applied. And I think, again, that's encouraging. Uh, so. Uh, we need to go forward from there. I think, interestingly, that Bob mentioned this issue about net neutrality, which is running very strongly here. I think that we perceive in Europe that our regulatory framework at the moment and the tools that regulators have to mandate access in a non-discriminatory way are perfectly sufficient to deal with the issues that are being raised at the moment, as I see under net neutrality. Some of you may want to comment on that. But interestingly, uh, linked to that, and, and this will be a piece of work that will come through next year, uh, will be issues around universal service and standards. 
And I think it seems to me part of the debate at the moment on, on net neutrality is uh, whether um, operators might choose to um, offer different levels of service, but might, if you like, deteriorate a core service in order to encourage people to take a higher quality service or a service operator offering um, something different or better or whatever it is. And I think that's obviously something that regulators have to look at, but I would argue that that can be done by some sort of minimum or universal standards and not by actively intervening in the market. I think that would be the wrong thing to do. Now, just a couple of other points, because I think that uh, we are also at a very interesting stage now in, in, in looking at the, at the impact of convergence and some of the new business models that are starting to emerge, and we should be pleased that they are, because this is a very dynamic market. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it, it is a duty on us as regulators, uh, certainly to keep a watching brief, but absolutely we should be encouraging innovation. So in, we're, example, seeing in Europe now a number of, um, of, of uh, telephone companies moving actively into video on demand and providing television services um, through, through broadband. Uh, we're seeing um, a, a, a lot of ideas about vertically integrating carriage and other packages, combining packages of broadband, uh, wireless services, maybe even television services, all of those uh, things are starting to develop. We're we also having a look at the European regulation at the moment on television and about uh, cross-border uh, cross transmission of television services and some of the issues about regulating broadcast services and how far uh, some of the, the provisions that are absolutely necessary in the public interest as far as broadcasting is concerned because people don't actually um, have a choice about what they see when they turn on the broadcast because that's defined by the broadcaster. Uh, but people are saying, well, are some of those provisions that apply to broadcast programs, should they also be provided to services that are delivered online or on demand? I think we're having a very lively issue in discussion about that and it would be interesting to get some perspectives on that. Uh, just my closing remark is that I think that um, we really would benefit, I think, from stepping up our dialogue in some other broader policy areas where we're seeing information technology having a fundamental impact. Particularly the application of information society tools to improving the quality and delivery of public services the way that we relate to citizens in the delivery of public services. Indeed, even concepts of engagement and involvement of citizens um, through, um, through internet-delivered services uh, and feedback through those. Uh, I think that uh, we haven't really been radical enough, I think, in many administrations in thinking through some of the impact on that. I think public service uh, is... Uh, still very largely organized on a traditional vertical model, uh, whereas we are seeing that uh, many companies who've adopted information society tools are fundamentally reorganizing and changing their organizations. Uh, and, and I think we should be doing more thinking about that because uh, I, think, I think we may be missing many opportunities um, through inertia or through some of the traditional ways that we're doing things. I think linked to that also, we need to be conscious about the, the way that information society tools will potentially revolutionize other crucial areas. I've been doing a lot of work on science policy recently, and there's been some extremely important work done by groups of scientists on looking at the way that the uh, availability of relatively low cost um, but very highly intensive computing power and data handling is completely revolutionizing the process of scientific discovery. And the question is, because we are all looking at science policy at the moment, I know you've been doing that, we've just signed off um, our next seven years of science research and investment, where by the way, at a European level, the, the second uh, biggest uh, budget line is going to research on information society tools at a European level. Uh, so we've made the decision that this is, a, this is a crucial instrument of public policy. But the question is whether we are equipping um, our universities and the people that work in them with the tools and the skills and the knowledge they need to be able to apply, to, to apply information society tools in the course of scientific discovery. 
whether it's in further enhancing um, our digital economic capacity and innovation, but actually in working in other areas as well, particularly in fields of bioscience, material science, and other areas where modeling and data handling tools are so fundamental. And in agriculture particularly, and I now end as I began, um, in agriculture, agricultural research, uh, that I, I think that the, the application of information and society tools will have an absolutely profound effect as well. So I hope we can have a very lively dialogue on a very broad canvas, and it's a great pleasure for us to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm, and thanks for touching on agriculture. We always welcome that here in this committee room. Um, if I might, uh, I'd like to start by saying a little bit about the net neutrality issue that you raised, and I think you've characterized it quite correctly, both uh, from your perspective in Europe and ours here, and that is, uh, is this going to be something where we set some overarching standards which need to be met, or are we going to have governing bodies engaged in minute regulation of how the Internet functions? And I certainly fall on the side of those who say that we should have standards that make sure that uh, we do have open access to the Internet. In fact, that's the term that Rick Boucher and I used several years ago when we had uh, legislation that really touches on the same issue that they've been attempting to address in our uh, telecom bill. In the uh, House of Representatives, the debate on the floor centered around an amendment that uh, some of us felt went too far into the regulatory aspect of it. Uh, and it was defeated, and defeated fairly uh, heavily. I voted against it myself. But I felt that there was another alternative out there that we didn't get the opportunity to, to uh, vote on on the floor, dealing with setting a antitrust standard and having that standard met by uh, the uh, telecom companies and cable companies and so on. And there's, a, I think, a solution to this that uh, is still uh, not being found. That debate has transferred over to the Senate now, and there in the committee, the net neutrality amendment, uh, I think is quite similar to the House amendment, was uh, defeated on a tie vote. And so now, if you watch TV here in Washington during your stay, you'll be treated to a great many <laughs> Uh, television ads which are, that are really directed at 100 people in the audience and their, and their staff, uh, the members of the United States Senate in anticipation of a floor amendment being offered uh, dealing with net neutrality. So I think the issue is not going away and uh, those who are opposed to doing anything about net neutrality, primarily uh, the phone companies and the cable companies have said watch us and see what we do. We're not going to uh, change the way the Internet operates. Others are not so certain. but. Uh, whether, whatever happens in the Senate in the final product of this bill, I think the issue is going to be ongoing as uh, the Internet evolves. And the thing we have to be most careful of, no matter which direction we go, is that we make sure that the enormous investment that we need to have made in this country to catch up with some of the countries that you mentioned in Europe that have uh, uh, rolled out broadband at a, a higher rate than we have, uh, that that investment continues to be made based upon the belief that they'll get a return on their investment once it's made. Obviously, the concern of those who are already engaged in the Internet and don't want to see their own use of the Internet restricted, Google and so on, uh, their access uh, to customers restricted, uh, their concern is we don't want the uh, people building out the infrastructure and making a deal with uh, investors to make that on the basis of something that will, in the future, change the dynamic for them. And so we certainly understand that position as well. Well, um, do you want to raise any other? Let's open it up to the floor. Yes. It's more lively. Anybody? I mean, we can talk for hours. Right. We want to. We know what you, want to know what you're interested in hearing about. Yes, sir. I'm curious. Um, well, that is an executive decision by the Commission, and the Parliament doesn't, is not involved in the implementation of competition policy. That is one area where, where the Commission has um, complete delegated powers, um, and uh, any appeals go through the um, European Court of First Instance, where I think the original fine is being appealed. Um, I mean, clearly, if, if 
if there is a, a, a wash off on that in terms of, uh, shall we say, affecting innovation or, or access, then obviously we, we would be interested. But otherwise, that is, that is a decision that the competition authorities make. And it's been done under competition rules, not on the, sort of re on, not on the regulatory regime that we're talking about here to do with telecoms. So uh, are you saying that uh, even if the Parliament viewed the issue as one of uh, justifying a change in the, in the underlying uh, statutory principles that are being applied by the Commission, that you have no jurisdiction to, to make that change? We have what? three comments, Mark and Brad. We have three comments on this. Um, Arlene, I would love to give the floor to Anna Snow, who is from the Commission. I'm happy she's here with us. And Bill Newton Dunn. Uh, so who would love to go ahead? Maybe Arlene first? Well, I don't know. difficult for me to say anything other than what uh, Commissioner Crowes has said. So if you will allow me, I When the Commission made its announcement to find Microsoft, uh, Commissioner Crow said, the Commission is obliged to ensure compliance with EU law, and I have always underlined my determination to ensure that Microsoft fully implements the Commission March 2004 decision. Uh, I regret that more than two years after the decision, and despite an order from the President of the Court of First Instance, that Microsoft appeal does not suspend Microsoft obligation to comply, Microsoft has still not put an end to what is we perceive as illegal um, conduct. And she said, we have no alternative but to levy penalty. Uh, no company is above the law. Any businesses operating in the EU must obey EU law. And I sincerely hope that the latest technical documentation being delivered by Microsoft will finally bring them into compliance. And that, final, and that further penalties will not prove necessary. It's difficult for me to go beyond that because it is not just the Commission itself, but it's also the uh, monitoring trustee who was appointed to look into the issue, which has found that Microsoft has not yet complied. I wonder if I might uh, follow up to that just a bit. Um, you know, this has been an issue in the United States for a long time, too. This, uh, obviously, the ability of Microsoft to uh, be the dominant player, certainly not the exclusive player. There are several com several significant competitors in the operating system market, but they're a clearly a dominant player. And we went through this process with our Justice Department, and uh, in that process worked out uh, an arrangement whereby Microsoft would cooperate uh, and license uh, companies to uh, utilize uh, their operating system and to be able to offer programming that worked in conjunction with their operating system. Uh, to date, uh, there are now 31 companies in the United States that are licensees under this program. So we're, we're making, a, I think, a, a legitimate effort both between the, the government concerned about this antitrust issue uh, and Microsoft concerned about its competitiveness in the marketplace uh, in doing that. But in Europe, we have not seen any cooperation there, so there's some feeling on this side of the Atlantic that this is uh, uh, another area that is damaging U.S.-EU relations in terms of what is fair competition and what is not, because obviously finding a way for Microsoft to continue to do business and protect its valuable uh, intellectual property, but also to license European companies to be able to do business uh, with Microsoft and uh, seek customers that uh, uh, they might otherwise be competing with Microsoft for, 
doesn't seem to be happening there. We just have this confrontation and fines, and uh, yet the U.S., the opportunity to license already exists. I wonder if there's any comment on that. Do you want to make a comment on this bill? Otherwise, yeah, okay, go. Sure, but if, if intellectual property is made uh, public and known and available uh, to people, uh, it's known and available and public to people everywhere, not just in Europe, in the United States and uh, any country in the world that's notorious for uh, pirating technology. So Microsoft's concern is a legitimate concern. Whether the solution that we've come up with in the United States is the best one, I don't know, but it is one that is allowing everybody to move forward and is not holding back everybody who would uh, want to be a licensee. That's not happening in Europe, and we wonder how we get from where we are now in confrontation to where um, we need to be without damaging a, a major U.S. company's ability to be competitive because it's intellectual property, it's, it's uh, trade secrets, if you will, are suddenly made known to the world, which seems to be uh, a part of what would be necessary to comply with the European Commission's order. I mean, we can continue on the issue, but I would, I would recommend to, to move on. I mean, it's a fascinating story. It, it will become definitely more, more complex and more complicated since uh, we have the, the question now in France pending on, on Apple and, and the iPod case, which is a pretty... I mean, a similar, not, not identical, but again, a similar case. And I, yes, it's the, um, absolutely. And I, I think I, I can only recommend that, the, you know, we take this, um, you know, to the next step in the second half of the year because the issue will not go away. And I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. We need to find a solution there. Um, and it's, it's complex in a second way, by the way, because American companies, of course, are involved in, in the European case as well. So it's not, you know, Europe uh, versus uh, the United States. It's not true. It is, uh, you know, it's a game which is played on both sides and which is carried, you know, between our two continents back and forward. And if there's not a solution 100% found in the U.S., it will be, you know, back to Europe and the other way around. So we, I'm, I only can recommend, yes, we should do this. We should work on it together. And I think from our point of view, we are happy to do this. I think we have a question or comment from the box seats. Shall, shall I just start on, um, on patent reform? Um, well, first of all, just a comment on, on the issues about jurisdiction, and, um, and some of my colleagues may also want to refer to that. Um, I mean, the first thing to say, I think, on the broader issue of, uh, of competition policy is that there is uh, has, and there has been developing very strong uh, collaboration between our respective competition authorities. I mean, that's been absolutely clear. Um, uh, Arguably, you might say that uh, perhaps we haven't learned enough lessons from each other in the Microsoft case. I mean, but nevertheless, they do remain that they do remain sovereign. I think that there wouldn't be, I don't think, any question about 
um, shared jurisdiction, but it's quite clear that in cases of mergers particularly, and there are a number of well-known cases that you'll be familiar with, that uh, in, in merger decisions where there will be economic concentrations that affect both our markets, then uh, certainly there's been a lot of shared information, but as we've seen in some cases, uh, the Europe and US authorities have come to different conclusions. Uh, in one case, actually, blo actually blocking the merger overall. And I'm sure, but I'm sure that's going to continue. On the question of patent reform, this is um, absolutely um, a, a major topic of discussion. We are awaiting um, a paper, a, a communication from the Commission about how to move this forward, uh, containing a number of reflections. One is um, whether anything further will be done about the attempt to uh, try and uh, define the conditions for patentability of computer-implemented inventions, uh, which was defeated heavily in the European Parliament uh, and was, was very controversial. I think the answer is that the Commission doesn't feel at the moment there's a case to do that. Uh, secondly, uh, the Commission is reflecting on the fact that there does not appear now to be as much political impetus as there was at a level of the 25 member states uh, to move forward to a single European patent. And that's actually a decision that has to be taken by unanimity. Uh, and it's quite clear that a number of member states are not prepared with the, the present proposal on the table to go ahead with that. And therefore, ideas about reforming some of the issues around the existing European Patent Convention um, whose members are rather broader than just the EU member states, are actively under consideration. So I think that the um, issue about um, the language in which the patent is translated and the costs associated with that, and trying to streamline the number of languages which is carried out, which is part of the London Protocol, uh, will be actively under consideration, um, as will also um, ideas around a patent litigation agreement um, so that uh, litigation uh, in one country under, the, under their jurisdiction and their patent can, will essentially can be adopted as uh, jurisdiction for all similar cases within the European Patent uh, Convention countries, which again would significantly uh, reduce the costs and time involved in, in defending patents. I think those will be very actively discussed. Um, there's, there's a more fundamental proposal, which is that the European Commission the European communities or the European Union itself um, should be a signatory to the European Patent Convention. I know this sounds a slightly arcane uh, perspective, but that, of course, would, would mean that essentially there wouldn't be a European patent, but that the European Union itself that we would have a common body of European patent law that would apply directly in all the, in all the member states, but would be governed by the Patent Convention as opposed to um, a European community piece of legislation.
want to make a comment on this, Arlene? No, on this on the subject, can I can I just make it? You, you want to conclude patent first? Yeah. The issue. Okay, quickly, go ahead, and then I answer the question. On, on patents very briefly, we will take this issue to Stanford um, and we will have a common debate there um, and we will visit companies and we will talk about the issue again and we do hope that we can find some common, uh, not identical, but some more common language than what exists in the moment. The second, I must tell you that your question, uh, this was raised in the Parliament many times and it was actually, if I remember well, the Parliament who was always asking the, co um, the, the uh, Commission to look into this, because you, you, you're so right, if there's no confidence and no trust on the Internet for consumers, they will not buy. I, I mean, the, the, the figures are still good, but I mean, we can see, and, and one can feel they could be much better, of course, and, and if you want to have an, uh, an, 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 an open Internet on one side, and you want to have a trust in the uh, economy behind this, which is developing and at fast speed, then, of course, confidence is, um, uh, it is more than relevant. So I, I'm pretty sure uh, when we, as soon as we will start a debate in the relevant committees, um, there will be support uh, on this issue uh, for, for the Commission. There might be doubt in other areas, but, but here I'm, uh, I'm more than convinced because we had many times debate on it and we always urged the Commission to look into this. Um, yes, I mean, I agree with that. At the moment, um, the Commission is... Um, has produced a consultation paper with a whole lot of possible suggestions, which is done in a comparatively low-key way. It's interesting in the announcement on the telecom review that those security issues weren't particularly highlighted as an, an area of policy, and you're, you very correctly picked them up from the paper. But they haven't actually had, actually had a great deal of public exposure yet. Um, the, uh, most of those aspects, I think, will be covered after the main competition provisions, because the Commission is going to come up with a green paper on the future provisions of universal service and users' rights, which I think will come out early next year. Um, yeah. It'll come out next year, yeah. And um, so some of those aspects will include that, because in the current user, universal service and users' rights requirement, um, security or network security is one of the provisions. Uh, and there, there will be a number of other issues related to that, of which I think the net neutrality issue and minimum standards will also be picked up. But there will also be other important provisions there around consumer information and, and some of the other aspects that we put in. And, uh, and things that I know you're looking at here also, um, like uh, mobile, call, uh, mobile call location for emergency services, for example, which was in the original proposal, and where technical standards, I think, are, have been running rather, rather behind the, the proposal. And I think, again, that the Commission, I think, has been consulting on trying to see whether we can reach some sort of international agreement on some of those standards. Uh, this gentleman had a comment, I think.
I'll just tell you from my perspective that uh, we want to we want the internet to be as open and uh, minimize the political elements of it as much as possible and uh, the drive for um, a change in the traditional relationship where the US government has had a I would call a very light touch um, relationship with the uh, ICANN and then companies like yours and others that uh, work uh, under that arrangement uh, has worked well to keep the internet uh, uh, open and free and uh, our first reaction to the effort to elevate that status to some kind of international arrangement was one of great concern that there were countries, uh, not European countries, but countries elsewhere in the world that didn't share the United States' view about free speech that uh, would uh, would challenge that. And so uh, our hope is that uh, we can maintain the status quo and that over here we have a discussion going on about what the uh, the future holds that can help to reassure other countries, including including members of the European Union, that uh, want to make sure the United States doesn't have some heavy hand in in terms of uh, control of the internet. But I'm not sure I can answer your question as to where it's going, other than to say that's where I hope it's going. Sure, Eric. I'm, I'm yes, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, it's it's such a tricky and difficult area. I mean, to discuss and. Um, um, and, and I want to be careful here because I think what is relevant to see that we made a lot of progress and my colleagues there too here, it's, um, it's Lambert and Malcolm who attended the VISIS meeting uh, in Tunis. I'm, I'm sure they would love to comment on this and, and both of them are going as far as I know um, to Athens. But I think there are three items one needs maybe to distinguish in a better way and one is of course how one can make sure that all countries and you know, all stakeholders feel part of the process, which is, I think it's a relevant one, because you, I mean, the internet is a global um, a medium, so you want to make sure that developing countries feel included. Now, we do know it's difficult because some of developing countries take a you know, very particular role in, in, in governing the internet, um, but still, we want to have an, a process which includes them somehow. Um, and this is not something new which is going on since quite a while. The second, I think, it is the question, and you are right, um, it's, the, it's the role about oversight. Um, the, uh, the State Department uh, uh, commerce plays to a certain degree. Now, one has to see, you know, how this, will be, how this will be shaped in the future. I mean, I have my own role, and I think keep things the way they are in the moment before you don't have another solution. But I know this is... Um, you know, seen uh, even in the European Union and um, by some of my colleagues differently. So, um, but that's, that's my point. And then the third item, of course, is, which is related to it. And it's um, something, you know, how do you shape, and it will be discussed very soon in September, if I'm not, not mistaken, um, the MOU, which will be, you know, renegotiated, um, I think, at the end of September or October. Um, I mean, uh, the agreement between ICANN and, again, uh, State Department, and Verizon plays a role in this as well. So, I mean, I think that a lot of positive messages are important and relevant, you know, reissuance, again, you know, of trust and confidence, and um, that I think this is more, will be very relevant, you know, uh, during the, um, the next months, and then um, just to make progress and, and to keep what you want, what I love to see, a light-handed internet um, and not an over-regulated one, but on the other side with you know, all the trust you want to have in the system for all stakeholders. Uh, can I just pick up very briefly on the on the internet to governance because I was one of the participants at, at both the world summits. Um, I think first of all the point you raise about um, the engagement of the of the private sector in these sort of international um, international sort of governments and policy making 
um, I think is not just confined to this. We had a very interesting breakfast meeting this morning where we discussed this. I mean, I think it implies just as much, for example, in things like WTO as well. And it's a broader issue, I think, that governments um, and industry stakeholders need to address in the broadest sense. And um, uh, as far as the uh, World Summit process is concerned, I mean, I agree it was uh, one that was formed very much by, one might say, the traditional United Nations sort of multi-government process. But nevertheless, I, I think it has been very, val very valuable in highlighting the importance of the information society. Uh, and I think it has seriously moved the debate forward. Now, now that we, we are moving into um, a very different format through the, the first of the, the global forums, the Athens Forum, uh, I think that will be handled in a very different way. And um, I, as far as, as we're concerned, from the Parliament's point of view, I mean, we very much would support um, the engagement, the full engagement of many different stakeholders and participants in it. And I think the European Commission same, shares the same view. And I think it's clear that, that the US government also shares the same view as well. Um, but what will result from that, finally, we'll have to see when we, we get to, to, the, to the Athens work. As far as RFID is concerned, I mean, I think that this, the RFID technology um, has um, huge potential benefits in a whole range of sectors. And therefore, I think that we are doing the right thing to pick up early on um, any uh, public interest concerns, particularly related uh, to uh, uses where issues like data privacy, um, personal privacy, um, control that individuals may have about data that may be used in particularly sensitive applications, for example, like health, all of those things. Um, and so I am pleased that we're having such an intensive debate at the moment, because I think the objective must be to try and deal with, with those issues with as light a touch hand as possible to reassure um, users that this technology uh, that we have put in that sort of framework and then encourage people to, um, to use it. Because, of course, in dealing with some of the other issues we've talked about this week, um, intellectual property uh, protection, pirating, counterfeiting, uh, it has immense possibilities in all of those areas in, in dealing with some of those issues in an effective way. And, and in terms of, uh, of, of, of the economy, but also the quality of public service delivery, which I emphasized at the, at the end of my remarks previously, particularly, I think, in health um, and social care, all of those things we need to encourage. And, and finally, from the Parliament side, uh, as well as the work that the Commission is doing, the Parliament has also um, commissioned work through our own science unit, so we have an independent perspective on that. We had our, held our own hearing the other week. Um, I, I can uh, talk about that because I'm, one of the, I'm the Vice President of the Parliament Science Unit. Uh, so we are also providing a broader perspective, which we hope will help the politi political decision-making in the European Parliament on this issue. Did it? Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, we're getting near the end. Let me uh, also respond to the question regarding uh, RFID from the congressional standpoint. The Internet Caucus uh, held a very excellent uh, panel discussion on this subject just a few weeks ago. 
Uh, some committees uh, have had subcommittee hearings uh, on aspects of it. Malcolm is exactly right. It's a very broad-ranging, far-reaching thing that uh, has a multitude of different applications in different sectors of our economy, uh, and it's very difficult for the Congress to get its arms around it, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, there are some bills in the Congress to try to uh, deal with some of the privacy issues related to it, but uh, I would be cautious in my approach to uh, regulation of it, and uh, we certainly want to air the concerns of the public because I think most of them can be reassured in most of the areas that uh, exist. Uh, brings us right back to the fact we're sitting in the Agriculture Committee because there's a big issue today with national animal identification uh, that runs right into this issue because RFID tags are one of the most common and popular ways to maintain uh, uh, inventories of animals. So. Uh, we will continue to uh, watch the issue closely, uh, but I think it's one where we should encourage people to be open-minded about it and to check what the ramifications are, but to not fear this technology that has a tremendous potential in so many different areas. Um, I think we've run past. I don't know where our European Parliament uh, members are headed next. Uh, they're welcome to stay here uh, if they enjoy our beautiful agriculture hearing room, but I'm sure they're headed somewhere else. But thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. For